which became a universal statement. Today, what has become of 784? Every road through life is a long, long road filled with joys and sorrows too. As you turn on... The name 784 comes from the claim that 7% of the people of this country owns 84% of its wealth. That's what the group claims. Establishing a company called 784 in Scotland in the early 70s was a wonderfully inspiring piece of, of utopianism. Head right on to the end of the road. And there was very, very much, of the, as we say in Scotland, the talk, the talk of the steaming. I mean, everybody knew about 784. Welcome to the 784 Theatre Company's production of The Cheviot, The Stag and The Black Black Oil. I think of that as being certainly the, still the, the, uh, the most fulfilling theatrical time uh, of my life. I'd never seen anything that affected me so much that actually touched my, on my background and also my political beliefs. I think probably the main contribution of 784, stylistically and theatrical terms, and also socially and politically, was that we tried to entertain people in the, the ways that they were used to being entertained. We took pop songs and turned them inside out. We took the idea of variety comedians and comediennes and made them say something that they were never saying before. What we were trying to do was to give people one, uh, an added awareness of what was being done to them by these cultural forms, and secondly, and most importantly, to give people a good night out. It was 20 years ago that the 784 company first took the high road to the Highlands, bringing a welcome new kind of entertainment to the far-flung village halls. It wasn't just the Highlands that 784 was interested in. They were just as likely to turn up for the show for people on a demonstration like this one. The fight was to take theatre about the people, for the people, to the people. Demonstrators are still here, so are the issues. And so is 784. Like the rest of us, they've been through some hard times in the last few years. Cuts, betrayals, alleged censorship, the loss of their founder. Now in the 1990s, the company claims to be on the way back, something approaching its former glory. The principle is still the same. The principle of, of 784 as it was, the fact that 7% of the population only 84% of the wealth then pointed to a massive imbalance within our society. Well, there still is a massive imbalance in our society in a whole number of different ways. I suppose the agenda is as it always was. It's to redress the balance and to challenge whatever we can. But from today's perspective, from a contemporary point of view. The company haven't been up to the north for three years now. We wanted to try and go back and see what our reaction will be then. We honestly don't know what, what that will be. We, we, might, we may get nobody, I don't know. I don't know. It'll be interesting. Um, there's certainly interest from the venues, and that probably goes back to the, you know, oh, the great 784, the big red truck, you know. I just hope they're not expecting the Chevy, the Stag, and the Black Black Oil. They're going to be disappointed. It begins, I suppose, in 1746, with Culloden and all that. The Highlands are in a bit of a mess. Speaking or singing the Gaelic language is forbidden. The wearing of the plaid is forbidden. It was a sharp enough piece of political analysis to link together elements of the Highlands' grim past, the waves of clearances, with what was then the Highland present, the exploitation of the oil in the North Sea. What none of the company had quite bargained for was the way it seemed to touch a nerve in the Scottish psyche. That pride in, in Scotland that is actually very cleverly dealt with in um, uh, the Cheviot 
the, the sense of, of, of a Scottish identity that had been subsumed by the kind of tartan culture and by that kind of quasi English culture, Edinburgh culture. There was a feeling that Scotland had a voice and, and by God they were going to let people hear it. It certainly wasn't the kind of voice they were going to hear in the cautious repertory theatres of the day. They might just as well have been in Surrey for all the connections they made with Scotland. And they certainly were not platforms for portraying the lives of the working class or querying establishment icons like the system of justice. The women, as they bore the brunt of the battle, were the principal sufferers. The wounds on their skulls and bodies showing plainly the severe manner which they had been dealt with by the police when they were retreating. Anne Ross, 40, struck on the breast, kicked in the head. Margaret Ross, 18, head split. Alienation of mental faculties, very perceptible. Elizabeth Ross, 25, knocked down, kicked on the breasts. The battens tore away part of her scalp, shattered frontal and parietal bones. Her long hair, clotted with blood, could be seen in quantities over the ploughed land. That's the kind of thing that we that happened. Lord Polworth was appointed the show was moving Minister for Oil. Oil. And the Daily Express put a headline uh, that day. It said, Lord of the Oil came out. And um, that night, we had the song to it? the tune of Lord of the Dance. Uh -huh. You know, Dance, Dance, whatever you with John and Alex wrote that together. Mm -hmm. I put it on that night. And it, the set, the, the, in Little Highland Hall in Rogert, I think it was that night we played the kind of gasp from the audience uh. that this thing that had only just been on the news that morning suddenly there was a there was a mm. piece it was the spinning image uh, was was on the stage but it wasn't taking a week to get there it mm. happened that night the people up in scotland were making such a noise teddy said for me because i'm a teddy boy <laughs> it was very exhausting because the audience expected a great deal from us and uh, not only on the stage during the play but also after the play we played a dance every night almost uh, lasting till two or three in the morning and for every village we went to it was the big night so it didn't matter to them that you may have been to 15 other places that fortnight uh, for them, you were there just once and they were going to get every last drop, so every story, every experience had to be shared for once and for once only. Almost overnight, the Cheviot overturned decades of received wisdom. Much of what we now think of as Scottish theatre, stylistically, politically, even geographically, owes its existence to that single, modest little show. It suddenly became this kind of universal statement, which was recognisable anywhere, and I, I didn't realise this until when it was translated into Mandarin Chinese, I began to realise that something... Uh, fairly uh, wide-ranging had, had emerged out of this local communication. In the early 70s, revolution was still in the air. But although McGrath from Liverpool and Liz McLennan, his Scottish-born but English-educated wife, may have had utopian ideals, there was nothing naive about their theatre-making. They'd already set up a whole other 784 to tour around England. It was a time when a minor strike could bring down a government. For those on the left, confidence was high. You lived in the back of transit vans and didn't think anything of it. So your life was very much, you know, living on 15 pounds a week and struggling up and down the country with a set. And uh, probably meal times were Indian restaurants at the early hours of the morning. And so there was great camaraderie in those days, but great debate all the time. Everyone spending every week arguing about where the future of 784 should be, what the politics of what we were doing. Money is the cause of poverty. Ah, oh, here he goes again. It's one thing to say it. It's something else to prove it, isn't it? All right, I'll prove it. Well, I'd like to see you try, Mr. Owen. Right. I'll show you how the great money trick works. It's 
it's marvellous, beautiful satire, beautiful done, make people laugh. But as a political idea, as political education, no, it doesn't work. It's seeing the truth that makes people laugh, not seeing the truth or a character eyes like you say. It's seeing the actual truth before the very eyes of what society is made up like. How far are you prepared to go? The songs are full of violent images like Stop Them, Do It Now. I mean, are you prepared to enter into the political arena uh, in any other way than as a theatre group? The way that we involve ourselves in politics is through uh, people's consciousness, not through violent activity. <laughs> North of the border, the Scottish company set about consolidating its initial success with more McGrath shows. The Games of Bogey, Boom and Little Red Hen, which once again linked the past, in that case the history of Red Clydeside, with the present. Audiences were getting used to the broad musical comedy and to tackling big political issues head on. Though anyone who'd thought the Cheviot was a vote for nationalism was in for a shock. Many witless people, some of them having the misfortune to be non-Scottish, have accused us of not having any policies. Well, of course, that's not true. We have. I remember them well. As a matter of fact, I've put them written down here somewhere on the back of this piece of paper. People often ask me after the show, do we mean what we say about the SNP? And I say yes, because we're interested in a socialist Scotland. Free of England, yes. But more important, free of capitalist greed, misery and exploitation. There was a wonderful moment in, in that, in the Little Red Hen, when it looked like you could actually pay homage to Chick Murray and still make a lot of sense of this text and the, and the position of, of Ramsay MacDonald. I'm going to exit left. I think that's significant. Of course, it won't look left to you. It'll actually look right to you. But if it looks right to you, I'm satisfied. Thank you. Because the one thing that Scottish actors do have is a tap into the sort of variety that's sector. That's right. Uh, that's what we've, we've always uh, had. Most of us began you know, seeing our theatre was at the pavilion or the, the kings or the mm -hmm. empires or the whatever, rather than uh, perhaps at the citizens. With its satirical songs and rabble-rousing polemic, 784 became part of the mainstream in left-leaning Scotland. In a way, it never quite managed in England. It kept on turning up new talent, too. So much so that in 1978, Dave McLennan and David Anderson were able to set up a whole new company, Wildcat. McGrath had been pumping out these plays for six years, two a year, three a year, right for the English company too. We got to a point where we thought, we need a break. And we wanted to do stuff that was more musical, that the music was more a part of the fabric of the thing, and not, in a sense, punctuation to the drama. More like a band doing a show than a theatre company. Because, in effect, that's what it was. <laughs> that's exactly what it was. We were uh, musicians who were, we'd learned something about acting. What it did for 784 and for John was that he could go back to basics. And in that following year, they produced three really great shows Joe's Drum, Swings Roundabouts, and Blood Red Roses. Blood Red Roses is about a woman who grew up after the war and became an activist at, uh, at a time when militancy was very much uh, out of favor in this country. There are some countries in Europe where you aren't allowed to go on strike or pick at your own factory, but anyone who's suspected of trying to organize anything let alone being a member of the Communist Party, gets taken away in the night and never seen again. I mean, there's a lot of folk in this country would like to see that situation here. And, and that's why we've got to organise and be boring and political and go on demonstrations against this government. We've got, in case they get away with what they get away with in Spain, Portugal, now Greece. And it was based on the story of a real woman and it was, uh, it was a struggle of a woman uh, in her fight to uh, retain uh, trade union recognition and membership and rights within the uh, electronics industry. 
Um, but actually what it did was explore the, her relationship with her husband and her father and her children um, and the effect that political activism had on that. It was kind of suggesting that things were not going to be good from now on for the left and, and also showed how difficult it had been in the past. So it was, I think it was quite an, um, an interesting kind of exploration of that whole, the politics of that period. And I hereby declare that Jonathan Said has been elected to serve as member for the Last time was terrible. So, Tony Byrne, when 1960... This time is pure torture. Don, I feel sick. What can they no do now? They'll crucify us. Another few million unemployed in the name of efficiency. Quote like me, footer in away your energies. You two, footer in away your lives. Perhaps more than one generation ago in the history of the Labour Party. The follow up to this success could hardly have been more different. The Clyde Built season. Instead of another new politically up-to-the-minute show, the company unearthed four plays from the past, from the tradition of fine working-class Scottish theatre, which the theatrical establishment had allowed to languish. In Time of Strife, Men Should Weep, Gold in His Boots and Johnny Noble were all produced in one season, putting enormous stresses on the company's traditionally cooperative way of working. And the performance style they needed, straight naturalism, was also not exactly out of 784's lapel-grabbing handbook. Despite this, Many still think that the Clyde Built season was the best thing that the company has ever done. Men Should Weep was directed by Giles Havergill and Ian Lionel Stewart wrote it, I think, in response to the Gorbals story and wanted to explore really that whole period in um, the 1940s in, in, uh, in, in Glasgow, in working class Glasgow, from a woman's perspective. And it was a deeply moving piece. I mean, people used to come out of that with tears rolling down their cheeks. And I mean, people who wouldn't normally be crying at the theatre. We went to the Edinburgh Festival and got a kind of review from Michael Billington that you would die for. You know, the kind of review that says that this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. One of the problems with the, the Clyde, uh, Clyde Built season was we, we simply didn't have the infrastructure that was needed for such an ambitious season. And there were one or two problems. Um, what happened actually was that we then had to cancel another tour because we had made the deficit, an unexpected deficit on, on that season. It was effectively running a repertory theatre and yet what we had was an administrative staff which was a tiny, I mean, me. What then happened was that I was very keen because we were only able to do two, maybe three shows a year, to develop a, a kind of parallel company called General Gathering. General Gathering was one of those wildly ambitious McGrath ideas designed to enable the company to stage work on the Clyde-built scale. For a moment it looked as if it might work when the company was invited to open its first show at the 1983 Edinburgh Festival. They went into it with very, very high expectations. It was, in fact, on the official festival, and then after having played in the official festival uh, for a week, it, it continued its run, but uh, in, in the fringe, and it was actually quoted by one critic, critic as being unique in the fact that it was the worst of both festivals. <laughs> um, and and a, a, an awful lot of resources went into that, um, uh, creative resources and financial resources. And uh, frankly, it was an unmitigated disaster. I mean, it was appalling. I think it did the company an enormous amount of damage. It, it rocked their confidence to a tremendous extent. And in some ways, they never actually recovered from it. Pressure was now growing on McGrath, with a new film company and 784 Scotland to run, and 784 England about to be cut off by the Arts Council. The Huns and the Visigoths are amongst us. I think the Vandals are at the door. Uh, I think it's a crass, stupid and ignorant Philistine act, and I'm extremely angry about it, as you can imagine. I'm quite sure that it's an act of political vindictiveness. The point about 784 and other similar companies, but I think particularly 70, 784, is that they took entertaining, profoundly and primarily entertaining, but also uh, educative and enlightening uh, theatre into people's own environments without all of the mystique and the limitations associated with the traditional theatre and uh, without the expense also associated with the traditional theatre, which for many, many people is virtually prohibitive. The arts policy in Scotland seems to follow London with a gap of about three years. And um, when the English company went, 
uh, Elizabeth actually said to me, we've got three years because that's the gap that occurs between what happens in London and what happens in Scotland in terms of the arts policy. And she was dead right to the minute. I was told, by the way, did you know that 784 have got one year's money and then we're cut? What was identified by the, the board at the time was that we had to get our objective clear and that was to save the company. And we tried to identify what had to be done. That meant uh, stiffening up the administration and Joe Beddo came in to assist with that. And it meant assessing where we were going artistically. And it meant taking into account the fact that if we couldn't satisfy the Scottish Arts Council, then the company would have uh, very, very great difficulty in surviving. I came up on my white charger, um, deeply excited and challenged about um, the task in front, which was actually to get the grant back for 784. Um, obviously, um, the consensus opinion was that this was a, a, you know, a, a terrible situation, that it was unfair. Um, and that uh, it wouldn't be too much of a task to persuade everybody that the company should survive. However, I mean, I have to be honest about this, um, that within a very short time, I discovered that perhaps that wasn't the situation, the one that had actually been described to me, that I, I have to say on a personal level, um, I felt that the Arts Council's um, criticisms or comments, should we say, about the company were, you know, had a, a lot of truth behind them. I had a choice, clearly, at that time. Either I could stand uh, on the bridge of the ship and salute and go down with the ship uh, heroically, or I could take a slightly more tactical view and say, well, maybe if I resign, somebody else can take over who will be able to use this subsidy, which has taken a lot of getting, uh, to do the right kind of work, similar kind of work. <laughs> In the end, McGrath did resign, and rather to everyone's surprise, 784's grant was reinstated. Many felt the company had little more to offer. Perhaps the Scottish Arts Council was dazzled by the appointment of David Heyman and Gerard Kelly as artistic chiefs. Certainly the lessons the early 784 had taught had long been absorbed by a new generation of companies like Borderline and Communicado. One way or another, the old company was still jostling for attention among the new pretenders. John McGrath had created a whole myth about 784, which was closely interlinked with himself, um, because he was a, an auteur. Um, I don't think he'd like me saying that, perhaps, but I mean, he was the writer, he was the director, um, he was the artistic director. Um, we obviously were not offering that kind of close involvement, and I think we were offering a new engine in this vintage car. We would like to identify younger directors that we want to bring through the ranks, younger actors, and just kind of exploit and explore uh, young talent in Scotland. And in the short term, Gerard is going to direct The Sash, so why have you picked that play? Well, I suppose because Glasgow's gone through a, a renaissance just now, you know, we're going to be the European City of Culture in 1990. I mean, everything's coming up rosies, but we still do have the problem of religious bigotry, and I think it's important that if we're going to have an actual real renaissance in terms of enjoying it, we've also got to, in some way, examine our faults. 1990 was, as far as I'm concerned, 784's year. We started off with a problem, which was about racism in Scotland. We then did govern stories, working with people in govern who wanted to write. And we came up with a piece that I think, quite rightly, gained a lot of, of recognition. This sounds arrogant. I don't think anything actually failed. I mean, I know what everybody will be saying, revolting peasants, um, which I thought was terrific. I stand by that show tremendously. That was the Mayfair show that we did in 1991, a farce about the poll tax. It concerns the adventures of a typical, um, I quote, Glasgow housewife living in a high-rise flat who's... Uh, in order to cheat the poll tax, has um, put herself down as a widow and says her husband doesn't exist. I mean, you've felt your form in Mary, haven't you? Yeah, I, sure, uh, in a manner of speaking. What do you mean, in a manner of speaking? Well, I might have kind of given the impression that I was a widow. My God, Mary, does George know his deed? You after he did kill me! Brothers and sisters, 
it uses it, it vulgarizes fast. It tries to, it tries to hit the audience over the head until they laugh. But it hits them over the head with rather unfunny lines. And the performances are so emphatic, not to say shrill, that uh, I began to feel, you know, that I was being pounded on the brain. Be reasonable, Gene. You can't mean it. Not Whatever the merits of the work, the Heyman Kelly regime balanced the books. But they didn't stay long. And although they put a brave face on passing the company on to a younger generation, the choice of new artistic director raised more than a few eyebrows. Ian Rickey was just starting school when the Cheviot first burst on the scene. But he started boldly enough, programming an ancient Greek drama and a recent Irish play. The lament for Arthur Cleary for me is, is a start in the way of redefining our theatre to make it more accessible to a whole number of people by producing work which is going to create a buzz enough that when we come back to the venue again, people are going to want to come and see us. The play looks at the character of Arthur Cleary who is a kind of everyman who's spent 15 years working on the continent in a series of factory jobs. Um, but carrying around with him this a vision and an image of home which maybe never existed and I think which is true of a lot of people who, who live away from somewhere for, for, for quite a long time. Check the wheels. For what? Just do it. Passport please. Oh, sorry. Ah, Irish. Boom, boom, eh? Yeah, boom, bleeding, boom. The play concerns him returning back to an island that has changed drastically from uh, his memory of it, which is kind of nostalgic, if you like, slightly rosy image, to a city which is suddenly it's changed drastically and where the estates are in the hands of loan sharks, drug dealers. And it's his struggle, in a way, to come to terms with that. Mrs. Doyle, you do your own dirty work, then. I don't think you uh, understand the situation here, Cleary. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. No, I... Scum of the f earth. You pick up every one of those, Cleary. I'll go away with you. Ah! Ah! No! Don't you ever look at me again! Don't ever trust me to be on the same landing as me! Ever! I, I was very pleased that the work was carrying on. And I felt very sort of positive about the, the the different thing but it was different from what we were doing and in a way i just wish that they would changed the name and not called it 784 because it was doing a good job and one that i valued for itself but it was it was different it wasn't the same it's another theater company yeah it's another theater company the past is there for me to learn from and to draw from in terms of developing our future experience. But it's not something which, I think if, if I were to allow that past to frighten me, it would, be, it would be detrimental to the company. I think really what I want to do is to utilize that in a positive way. I think perhaps 784's reputation um, is, is bigger than 784 is in itself. And I think that's very important to note. We're a small theater company. If I were to start now and think, oh, 784, you know, the, the original touring theatre company, then I think it, I would never get the job done. It's hard work for speaking. Oh, come share, he'll be tired the night. I'll sleep on the flare mag and gauge on the bed. The hail city's quiet, no. It kens that he's resting. At him where his Glasgow friends, their fame and their pride. The Reds will be warm, my lads, and Scotland will march again. No great John McLean has come home to the Clyde.